Welcome to the Under Armour uh, Jordan Spieth Championship. Uh, my name is James O'Brien. I'm the tournament director. Um, really appreciate everyone um, coming out to the fun Q&A today. Hope you guys had a um, fun first round. Um, but before we get started, a few things about our host, Jordan Spieth, I'd like to mention. Um, in his junior career, Jordan was a five-time AJGA champion, two-time USGA junior amateur champion, and was the 2019 Rolex Junior Player of the Year. Jordan went on to play collegiate golf at the University of Texas, where he was named the Big 12 Conference Player of the Year and helped the Longhorns win a national championship in 2012. Jordan turned professional in 2013, and he has won 12 titles on the PGA Tour, was this year's Valero Texas Open winner, and is a three-time major champion. So let's give a big round of applause to our tournament host, Mr. Jordan Well, awesome. So thanks so much for being here, Jordan. Yeah. I know um, it's a busy time for you, especially with the playoffs right around the corner. So I'm it means a lot to all week. of us and yeah. uh, to be here at your event. So, um, but I know we don't have too much time with you, so we're gonna just dive right into some questions. So, and as you know, um, all you submitted some questions via Instagram. So maybe it's lucky enough that we're gonna ask some of yours here. And if uh, not, if they're, I mean, we can open up for, if y'all, if it, any of our questions yeah. need any more than definitely oh yeah to, oh yeah, yeah there might be some opportunity for that down there so uh, but here first one so um, you know do you think something set you apart from everyone else when you were a junior golfer kind of being on the upper end and if so what uh, I, I played a lot like I, I just I loved playing I didn't love practicing a ton uh, I used to I grew up at Brookhaven which is probably 25 30 minutes north of here um, I'm not sure, some of y'all may be familiar with it, but uh, I grew up there and they had this little Astro turf chipping green and it was super firm. So it forced, there was one bunker and a netting and it wasn't, wasn't like a great chipping facility to practice at. Now they have a great facility, <laughs> but um, I had to learn to kind of spin a lot of shots, like hit flop shots, stop the ball really quickly on those kinds of greens. Like, so I, I used a lot of imagination in practice um, that wasn't maybe totally necessary for Kind of the events I was playing at the time, but as you started to kind of get short-sighted and greens get faster, greens get firmer, um, harder tracks, I think it really helped. And then I had a you know a good group of um, friends out of out there that I played a lot of golf with in the summertime, played like 27 holes. Like, and so you just learn how to score. I think that was the thing was just learning how to score versus learning how to swing. Um, and honestly, I think on tour that probably needs to be taught more than it does in junior golf. Yeah. Um, I've certainly fallen into the trap of trying to swing versus get out there and score. And um, I think that's kind of the number one um, thing you see kind of, especially with technology nowadays, is as advantageous as it can be. It can also, um, too much of it without really being outwardly focused on shots that you're playing, doing combines on the range, practicing or playing while you're practicing kind of thing. Um, I think that's certainly should be emphasized more so and then kind of use technology to help when you get a little bit off um, kick back thing get get things into gear so long way of answering I think um, I, w I, I stayed really focused on how to score um, kind of learned how to go low didn't get you know try to you push two three under and then you start getting nervous and then you fall back to even you do that a couple more times and all of a sudden you feel a little more comfortable and you learn how to shoot five six under rounds and um, and go from there where your firepower gets higher and then the limiting mistakes on the back end I think is a little easier than learning how to make birdies, learning how to go low. Um, I thought kind of shooting some low rounds at a low age, kind of how, even if it was an easier golf course, posting a lower round, finishing that round off was important. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's good. Um, so next one here. Uh, what was the part of your game that you worked on daily or the most as a junior golfer? Yeah, I would say when I was on the range, I most of the time was just it, I was warming up to play. Um, I would see my instructor, and that would be more of the um, that would be kind of more of the range work that I did. But uh, I did a lot of like I just mentioned earlier. I did a lot of chipping, a lot of kind of imagination chipping contests, playing twenty one, um, and then putting. I, I used you know uh, I would use the Dave Pell's putting tutor. I saw someone had it out on the putting green today. I would use that all the time just to get kind of alignment check, eyes check, um, get your stroke down, and then uh, putting contests, doing performance putting, you know, three feet, four feet around the hole, eight feet around the hole, whatever it may have been, 
you know, I've had different routines over the last, you know, 10, 15 years that, you know, change up things a little bit, make it more exciting than doing the same thing over and over yeah, again. Yeah. And uh, I think, so short game mainly for practice and then range was kind of, if things were on, it was warm up, don't overdo it, go out and play and score. Yeah, nice. So you hear that chipping and putting down there. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> shocked that I said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Um, so what point in your junior career did you discover ways to improve your mental toughness? Well, I would say it was quite a bit easier mentally um, as a junior. Uh, you're kind of, any, any expectations or pressure you're kind of put on yourself and that doesn't make it easy, but a lot of that was more just experience, just putting yourself in position enough times. Like I mentioned with the scoring, you do it a couple times, okay, I've been here before, you know, what's the next stage? Same with competing in an event. You know, I'd, I'd get, I'd work myself into, you know, the, the top five and you'd see the camera show up, you know, and you know, back, I don't, I don't exactly know how it is now, but you would only have someone recording your putts and shots in AJGA events when you were right towards the lead, you know, the first. We, we still kind of do that. Yeah, so. <laughs> and I, you'd get nervous when the camera came up and, and so you learned kind of once you did it enough and, um, you know, you got bet yourself back in that position, and that doesn't change. That goes level to level, and it really isn't like I was probably just as nervous um, the first couple times contending in an AJG event as I was on the PGA Tour. There probably was no, there was no higher heart rate. It was probably the exact same. Um, stage to stage, it's just about putting yourself in that position to be a little bit more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you probably have to be a little bit more consistent of a player to do it more often at, at a higher level. Um, but as far as adapting and getting comfortable contending, I, I would say it's, it's very similar. Um, you're gonna kind of re-go, if you, if you go through that process of junior golf, you're gonna re-go through it in college, you're gonna re-go through it again, but it's, it's really not that different as far as um, the comf getting comfortable under pressure, learning kind of what your tendencies are, and then, and then making your adaptations to, to where, you know, you can be the one that's standing and holding the trophy more often than the one that you know didn't quite get there yeah. and as we all know in golf that's if you win at a 10 percent rate that's pretty special yeah. and very few people do that so um i mean relative to kind of times that you're in contention yeah definitely um so what are you kind of going along with that i guess um kind of a good segue is you know what separates you know the good golfers to those great golfers that do you know win you know, maybe more than 10% of the time or has a lot of those wins? Well, I think, I mean, the easiest answer is just to say consistency. Um, having the ability to be a top 10 player in each category of the game. Um, the guys who you see that win a ton are ones that, you know, can be the best driver of the golf ball that week. They also could be the best iron player. There are times their short game you know, saves them, and then there's times where they go out and they make everything. So having kind of the ability to to be the best that week at any category of the game is kind of the difference versus guys who continue to struggle at one part of their game, and it's never going, it's never better. They don't really dial it in enough to to have that part of their game become the best for a couple weeks. Um, you just know that's going to potentially hold them back, and uh, versus kind of having the consistency through your game of kind of having each part. I mean, I, you know, the last few years, I kind of, I would, there was no week where I was going to be the best driver of the golf ball. So I needed to kind of say, okay, what was, what was going on? How do I kind of get back to where, Hey, this week I can actually use my driver as an advantage. And if that's the case, I know the rest of it can be. And so I know I can win. So it's, if you're able to pick apart that weakness and then turn it into a sh and, and, and work on it and be able to turn it into a strength relative to your competitors, that strokes gain method that we all look at, um, or that strokes gain um, stat that we all tend to look at now. Um, I think that's probably what separates kind of the, the greatest golfers from, from the really good ones. Okay. That's good. Um, you know, what goes through your mind before a big tournament and how do you organize or control those thoughts? Oh, I guess the easiest way for me to answer that question would be kind of what's it like going into the Masters every year just because mm -hmm. it's the first major you haven't played one since the previous July so what is that eight months 
has gone by, um, eight, nine months, where the anticipation is just higher and higher. Mm -hmm. um, when you're kind of, when, you know, we play, we play so many tournaments now in, the, in a season that when, you know, even like the U.S. Open, it's like, well, I just played four out of five weeks before, so I can go into it thinking of it as a normal tournament. And I just got to kind of get to know the golf course and understand what the U.S. Open means, all right, par's a good score, that kind of. So it, it's actually not that hard, um, I don't think, to adapt to that when you're used to being in a groove. But that first one, the Masters, normally there's, you go through the gates there and you're like, all right, you know, this is, <laughs> yeah. this is a different feeling um, than last week, you know, wherever I was. And no disrespect to any tournament, but um, it just turns into uh, – a lot of it is less and more, less is more is what I've learned over. I used to, I used to spend eight hours on at the golf course Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before the Masters, and I've kind of learned to taper that into. All right, let's get kind of our heavy day out early, and then let's kind of taper it back because if you're in contention there, it takes so much energy physically and mentally out of you that you don't have anything left by Sunday sometimes if. Um, and you can run on adrenaline, but it's not the same. But um, trying to taper it back and saving a lot of strength going into those weeks, which seems like the opposite of what you see most people do. Um, most people, when they're going into the biggest tournament of the year, are just preparing unlike any other tournament. And I just try and I try and approach it like another tournament, having done a lot of the heavy work the week before into kind of that Monday, maybe early Tuesday. Uh, so it, it almost I don't feel underprepared because I actually feel like I'm going out and my range sessions turns into, instead of hitting 200 balls, I've hit 75, but they were step back, pick a shot, pick a target, what's the trajectory, you know, my, here's the drive on 14. You know, and actually playing the golf course on the driving range, you actually hit less golf balls, but you get on the golf course, you're like, okay, I just hit that shot on the range. And um, you can just start to kind of just try and hit so many shots. and. I don't think that that helps as much leading into those big tournaments. You almost want to feel like, I just hit this shot. Um, let me work on, okay, I, I didn't really, my draw three, what I need on number two, you know, doesn't, doesn't feel that great. Okay, let me spend five shots hitting that one, make sure I start to actually feel better about it. So um, tapering it back, um, almost approaching it like uh, the rounds as you get into it and being out on the golf course doing a lot of shots on and around the greens get me most prepared. Okay, nice. Um, whoever submitted this question I'm interested in, this is a good one. So how did you find and choose your caddy, Michael Greller? So Michael, Michael, um, I tend to make a lot of stories longer than they need to be. Michael <laughs> was a teacher, sixth grade teacher up in the Seattle area. He caddied at Chambers Bay in the summer times. The U.S. Amateur went to Chambers Bay in 2010. He got paired with Justin Thomas, um, a friend of mine. The U.S. Junior went there in 2011. I was young enough to play. Justin wasn't. Justin said, hey, my guy plays out there sometimes. The guy I used, I liked him a lot. I used him. He stayed in touch with both of us, caddied for Justin and a couple of U.S. Ams, caddied for me and when I was an amateur in the U.S. Open at um, uh, Olympic Club. and. When I was turning professional, I didn't have status. And so I wasn't going to get any of the veteran guys that um, would have wanted to take a chance with the younger guy, like you see some of them do with um, Morikawa and um, some of these younger um, studs on tour. And so Michael, I called Michael up and I said, I'll, I'll pay you what your teacher salary was and I'll cover your expenses if you want to do this. And he said that he wanted to change and he wanted to do it. So we ended up on the web.com now the corn ferry in south america for a few weeks which he had never been neither one of us had ever been down there so that was interesting and <laughs> and then worked our way onto the pga tour by the end of that season and um so it was kind of lucky i guess yeah uh, but he did a great job staying in touch and uh so yeah so he's he was kind of a friend of both of ours first and mm -hmm. then turned into being a great cat yeah awesome that's cool um so a lot of people complimented your putting via Instagram. So a lot of them want to know what you know, what advice do you have on putting, reading greens, kind of all catch all there. Yeah, so I've actually um, putting wasn't a strength of mine in junior golf. Definitely not a strength of mine in college golf or rookie year. Um, 
you know, I could, I could make birdies, but it wasn't, you know, I, under pressure. I, I was, I wasn't a great putter, um, and I wanted to figure out why and, and really learn a lot more. I got a lot better. I've always been a pretty good green reader naturally, um, and speed control has been pretty good. And so, even on a bad day, I was able to, you know, putting wasn't going to let me down, but it wasn't necessarily going to win for me um, growing up. Uh, and then. You know, I want to say second, third, fourth year on tour, somewhere in there, I started to just get really dialed in with my stroke. Um, I started to figure out some ways where um, I was less impact focused and more reaction focused. So I started looking at the hole um, or looking at a spot a few feet in front of me on kind of shorter range putts so that I got off of making the perfect stroke and starting it directly online and instead um, just letting kind of my brain and hands just do the work and just and just pop it. Um, I would say in green reading, uh, the number one thing that I do is I, I don't walk above the hole. I walk, I look at it from behind. I walk around the low side of the putt um, to the back side of the hole, read it from the back side of the hole, back around the low side. I learned this from actually Dave Stockton Sr., maybe in 2013. And it was kind of the way I already read putts, but it was, he explained it better than kind of what I just did um, naturally and kind of read it in thirds. So the first third matters the least, the second third matters, you know, obviously second, and then the last third is the most important part of the putt because the speed gets lost, and so there's more break. And after going along the low side of the hole, seeing it from the back side and realizing kind of, okay, putt's gonna break a little bit less at the beginning, a little more at the end, I start to see kind of the arc that you would see on, um, on TV when they show the, um, I don't even know, who sponsors it now, but the, the point either. outside the hole, <laughs> and you start essentially saying, like, I think this is going to go in at 7 o'clock, right? So I start to see the actual arc of the putt, and um, within that, I then find kind of a midpoint of that putt, some, a blemish on the green or, um, you know, a, a piece of poana or something, and I'm rolling it based on the speed of what I just read. I read it speed first, and then I go into, okay, with the speed I want to make this, where does this have to track into the hole? And I start to and I start to find that midpoint. I want to roll it around or underneath or over in the midpoint of that putt, and it just keeps me very again outwardly focused. It keeps it away from the stroke and instead in um, matching line to speed, and uh, and I think that's a big reason why from the mid range game I've been very successful over the last you know eight years on tour or whatever it may be. Okay, good. Um, so you may or may not know this, but Justin had his tournament this week, his AJJ yeah, yeah, yeah. tournament. So yesterday, um, he got asked about Texas joining the SEC, and he was like, yeah, me and Jordan, I think we're going to be talking a little more smack now. So I'd, I kind of want to hear your thoughts of Texas, Texas joining the conference. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's number one, a football move. But I think it's great for all of our sports, too. Uh, you know, I... For golf, I think it's a good thing as well. Uh, there's obviously great teams over in the SEC, some of the best in the country, and then Texas has been, you know, preseason and through the season, you know, they've had some obviously incredible talent, and I think it's I think it's good for football. Um, I think we still got a couple years where, of <laughs> adjusting before we can before I have anything to say back to an Alabama fan, but <laughs> um, but I'm sure he'll try and poke. Yeah, um, but it'll be fun. It'll be fun to go to those games. It'll be fun to. I think we're just kind of trying to get ahead of the curve. I think the super conferences was inevitable at some point um, for whatever it may be, three or four super conferences. And I think with Texas and Oklahoma kind of taking that first step of, hey, we want to get ahead of the curve. And yeah, I, I'm excited about it yeah. personally when the, where I am now. If I were considering Texas or Oklahoma as schools to go to I, as a junior golfer, I'd be excited as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so. Before we will have um, some of y'all be able to ask some questions to Jordan here, but before we get to that, I'm just going to hit you with some rapid fire questions. Okay. okay? So, um, some hard hitting ones here. So, um, so I'll just go right into it. So, your favorite AJJ tournament as a junior? Probably the Thunderbird. Thunderbird? Okay. Current Netflix binge? Uh, <laughs> Ted Lasso, I'm waiting for Yellowstone to come back. Okay. Yeah. Favorite golf course you play on tour? 
On the PGA Tour, yeah. um, Riviera. Riviera. Okay. Um, do you listen to music while you're warming up? And if so, what genre? I don't normally listen. Um, I'm normally talking too much with Michael. <laughs> uh, if we're in the car, what do we listen to? Uh, I, I'll either listen to kind of... I listen to country music, but I also listen to kind of like how, like Kygo Radio or like yeah. house music too sometimes. Okay. So I just, it really just depends. Like if I'm going to a workout, then it changes. And yeah. if I'm going to golf course, it's, yeah. For sure. Favorite club in the bag? Probably my 60 degree. Okay. Yeah. And then last one here, name one tournament on tour you look forward to every year. Uh, Jack's event, the Memorial. Okay. Yeah, that one's like, we're just, not that we're not spoiled every week but we're very spoiled that week. yeah yeah awesome well those are good yeah. um okay so if you uh ra if you have a question um feel free to raise your hand emma will kind of call on you and we just want you to stand and then you know say who you are and fire the question off so i know we have some out there everyone's being shy <laughs> yeah, we'll go. Chip, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Get us started. Sevens, uh, my wife Marcy, who's hiding from me because she knew I would ask the question. Uh, <laughs> we were on the, this tournament committee with James. So, uh, but there are a couple of things I wanted to thank you for before my uh, question. Uh, first is, uh, I wrote a letter to your and Andy's foundation on behalf of a, uh, a friend that, that runs a foundation for autistic children, and you responded with a contribution. Second thing is, uh, my boys, uh, Brooks and Charlie, have crossed your path a couple of times. They train where you train, and you've always been gracious enough to stop and speak to them, despite the fact that you're a busy person that's got a lot of other things to do. So I just wanted to say those were two things that everybody here doesn't see on the Golf Channel, and I wanted to thank you for it. Appreciate that. Now, my question is, I've looked around on the oldest guy in the room, right? <laughs> so I've heard that. Uh, and I was just curious, with all the advances in the science around physiology and nutrition, what you see is the lengthening of players' uh, productive careers. You see, you know, Westwood, Phil, a lot of the older guys. And so while I'm a big fan of yours, I do find myself rooting for the older guys to sit <laughs> now. But, Fair enough. Uh, but how has that changed the view of your, the longevity of your own career? And how do you think that impacts um, opportunities for younger players to break into the PGA if all the young stars like yourself are going to be around for another 20 plus years? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I I never th I never thought. I guess I've always thought of g going into professional golf as you know a, a 25 plus year career. Anyways. I've always been confident that I could stay healthy and compete till 50 and beyond. Um, but to see these guys in the level they're competing at now gives me a, quite a bit of confidence on being able to compete at the highest level in your 40s and beyond consistently. I, did, I guess when I looked at it you know, 10 years ago, it was okay, these guys are still playing PGA Tour events, they're still here and there, they're competing in a major or, or winning a, a tour event. But you don't see the the consistent um, what they you know top ten in the world like they were when they were you know in their twenties and thirties. I think now it's it's even more possible after seeing what these guys are doing, kind of almost trailblazing the caliber of play in their forties and, and even fi after fifty years old. Uh, I when you mention you know the younger players getting out on tour and, be, and becoming successful with the idea that we would be the older guys and still on tour at that higher caliber. It, it's weird because you, there's, you're seeing no issues with the average age getting younger, even though you have these, you know, half a dozen to a dozen guys that are in their mid forties to early fifties still contending. It's, it's, it's odd. It's, you'd think that that would mean it's harder for the young guys to get, but it's almost, it's almost, I think the average age is down, but the chances of competing and winning at any golf tournament now ranges 30 years, when it may have ranged, you know, 15 or 20 for 20 straight years on, on the PGA Tour. If, does that answer that? I mean, it, it's, it's, it can be young, it could be anyone. It's so competitive, it's very difficult to win. Um, 
the tournament I won this year, I thought going into it, if I just kind of played patient golf, you know, shot a few under, just played consistent golf like that week, it'd be no problem. And then I got Charlie Hoffman shoot 66 in the same group, and I'm like, give me a break. You know, he chips in twice. And, yeah, it's just um, very rarely do you see a situation where people are taking their foot off the gas anymore. You normally have to go win tournaments, and it, that's, that's every age. Phil won the PGA this year. Um, and then Colin just won the Open. And they're 30 years apart. So, um, and that's not abnormal week to week right now either. Thanks. Yeah. It's inclusive of everyone. <laughs> All righty. Come on. Oh, right over here. You want to stand in tux? Andrew, you have? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, going into a tournament, you you know you can be. I mean, you're anxious, right? More, hopefully, because you you just want to be out there and get going. You don't want to sit around and wait any longer. Hopefully, it's anxious and not kind of um, not anxiety. You know what I mean? The difference there. Uh, I would say uh, it was kind of like the as far as going into a tournament. I'd say more of that prep work where. I get really focused on that golf course. What shots are needed there? Let me hit those shots on the range. Let me, so I can get out there and be like, man, I already hit this shot. I just hit it, you know, an hour and a half ago. Uh, let me, let me I, I, this one needs to fade a little bit more. I need to take five more yards off of it, adjust off of that shot I already hit kind of thing. Um, you just feel more prepared, makes you more comfortable. As far as sleeping on a lead, that has changed. I used to just kind of sleep fine, you know, in junior <laughs> golf, amateur golf. And then, you know, I mean, I, I had, um, the year I won the Masters, I, had, I was leading um, after each round. And I was 21. And I had, the, the previous year, finished second, where I had a chance to win. I think I was tied for the lead going into Sunday. Took the lead on the front nine, lost it on the back um, to Bubba. And I went in that next year, and the expectation was to close that out. And it was four shots going into Sunday. And I remember thinking, I wanted to keep myself up so that I could sleep in because I didn't tee off till almost three in the afternoon. And it didn't matter. I still woke up at like 6.45. The second I knew that what that day was, the second I woke up, you know, my heart rate goes to 80 from 60, right? So um, it, there was not a whole lot I could do there except for just kind of, um, I, I've been working a lot lately actually on some breathing stuff, some, um, some neuro stuff, did a lot of research with this company and and have um, been practicing kind of how essentially to get in the zone via breathing. And so I do a lot of that now that really helps um, after sleeping on a lead. And then the other thing is just managing the expectations. Just, it's really hard to do because you, you want it so bad, you want to win so bad. Um, but the idea that you can wake up and say, I've done all the prep I can. I'm going to picture every shot the way I want. I'm going to be fully committed today. And same with every putt. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going to figure out why, and then I'm going to be better the next time. And if it does work out, why did it work out? You know, and and let's duplicate that, and let's get even better. So, more just um, being just as competitive, but not needing to win. Instead, recognizing that it's going to happen. The more the more consistent, more often you put yourself in that in that position. So I sleep easier and easier as the season goes on. The more times I've been in that position versus. This year in Phoenix was the first time I'd had a lead going into Sunday in quite a while, um, maybe the 18 Open Championship, and I didn't sleep very easy. But the next week I had the same lead. I slept great. And I went out and I was fully committed. I felt like I played well. And at Pebble Beach this year I had a lead starting the day and I didn't win the golf. I didn't even get second. I got third, I think. Um, which afterwards, you know, I have to answer questions on why that's disappointing. And to me, I'm like, I actually felt more comfortable. Just wasn't my day. Swing wasn't quite on yet. I knew I knew it wasn't, but I was. I, it was on good enough to win, and and I just didn't produce the shots. Just didn't execute. And if it's not if it's an execution error, I'm fine with that. If it's a decision and I let myself um, make these mistakes, uh, I guess via um, 
my own, am I getting in my own head, something like that, then, then I'll be mad at myself. But I, I went into that day, I'm like, well, it's coming. And I'm fine with that. And it, it just, it's an easier way to sleep if you're kind of not, you don't, ha- you don't need it. Instead, you want it, but you don't have to have it and, and you know it's going to come. Good question. Um, I think we have time for one more question real quick. Did we? Um, you can get both of y'all. Um, yeah. um, if you were a professional, what career path would you Good one. Um, <laughs> I'm probably not the best person to ask that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't recommend dropping out of college like I did, but um, I didn't really have a great idea other than luckily golf worked out. Um, I was, I was going to try to go into the business world. I studied communications at Texas the brief time I was there, but um, I would have tried to go into the business school. Um, I would have loved to have been an entrepreneur. I've kind of taken that a little bit into, you know, how I spend some of my time now. Um, but I, hopefully that answers that, yeah. yeah. I didn't love school enough to be a doctor or lawyer, you know, the extra <laughs> school. Um, so I, but I would have, I liked kind of the real world and kind of, yeah, selling. We'll get you right up front here. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Daryl. Uh, thank you, Jordan, for missing the tournament. Um, what would you say your biggest tip is for gaining distance, whether that's like in the workout room or mechanically in your swing? Um, sorry, I wish I had Bryson here today for you to answer. <laughs> uh, I'm, I've been actually focused more on the, the other side and, and trying to hit more fairways, even if it gives up some, but I've actually not. I've actually gained distance each year, um, whether that's technology or me or both. Um, I would say, yes, I mean, I, everybody's in the gym now. Uh, this has been the Tiger movement. Um, it was kind of like that when I started, but even the last five years has been a different level. There's no space in our gym trailer that travels every week because everyone's in it all the time. Looking to just get more stable balance um, so that they can have that stability through the swing people are doing lifting. There's a lot of different ways, I think, to go about speed. Um, I've not studied much into it because I haven't cared as much as I have about other things right now um, to gain it because I don't feel that I need to. I hit it further than I did when I was ranked number one in the world. So I don't, I know I don't need um, that if I can make up for it elsewhere. Uh, But as far as the uh, I would say more in the gym than necessarily trying to change mechanics of the swing. I think, you know, power, it's a ground force, right? So it's figuring out how to use the ground more to your advantage within your own self, within your own swing. I think the second you try and, you know, break open to change a lot of things, it just jeopardizes parts of your game that might act, act statistically be more important. Again, on that strokes gain category, they're finding that how far you drive it is at just about as important as anything, but still not as important as proximity to the hole and, and, and putting. And so I would say within yourself, via the gym, speed work, fast twitch muscles, just to where you can swing your swing, but be able to potentially do it a little more efficiently using a little bit more of the ground ground up. I mean, you know, so Rory, Justin, these are guys that are not very big guys that that bomb it and they use on they have an unbelievable amount of ground force that they use and they they spend time in the gym perfecting it um it's not a real answer because i don't really know uh but i would recommend swinging your swing and figuring out how to make that as fast as possible well awesome well everyone want to give jordan a round of applause thanks